Well, good morning, Holmes United Methodist Church. Uh, Also, welcome to our friends from Trinity Lutheran and Beaver Creek Lutheran today. My name is Rob Sulmans, and I'm the pastor here at Holmes, as well as the two Lutheran churches that I just mentioned. And it's a a joy to have you with us this morning. Uh, As I've shared on Facebook, uh, the good news is that uh, Rachel's COVID test and my COVID test are negative. Uh, The bad news is that I do have something, and and she has something that we think she's shared with Alex now, so still some sickness going around in our house. Uh, I am still dragging a little bit, which is why I'm I'm here. I'm not sure if I could stand for the whole surface, so I'm just going to uh, uh, sit for today. Um, Not much in line of announcements uh, for today. The only one that I did want to mention is that our Advent Bible study is uh, on this book. It's by Adam Hamilton called It Was Not a Silent Night, and it's uh, Mary Looks Back to Bethlehem. I have ordered this. I've ordered about a dozen of them, and they'll be coming in the mail. But if you uh, would still like to be a a part of the study and you haven't uh, told me yet, I'll have a couple extra also. If you want to uh, go online, you can get an electronic copy of the book for the Kindle. Um, I suppose that you could also uh, get it on your uh, laptop if you wanted to. So there are other ways that you could uh, get it besides just the physical copy. There are five chapters to it. The first is, I can find it again, beginning with the end, and that is the end of Mary's life. Um, It goes backwards here. The second chapter is the piercing of Mary's soul, which is the uh, crucifixion and the uh, arrest and trial of Jesus. Uh, Chapter three is amazed, astounded, and astonished. And that is when they took Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem and they accidentally left him behind when they went home. Um, The fourth chapter is uh, Mary full of grace, which is where she learns that she is going to be giving birth to the Christ child. And the very last one it is, it was not a silent night, is when the birth actually takes place. So if you would like to uh, be in on that study, just let me know and I'll get that for you. Uh, The only other announcement that I have to make you aware of is that uh, Dick uh, Schrader passed away early this morning. So I'm going to ask that you keep him and his family uh, in your prayers at this time. And uh, now I'm going to invite you to center your heart and your mind for worship this morning as the prelude is played. join me now in our opening prayer. Christ, who is love and life, wait with us now. Prepare us to receive your presence. Strengthen us to wait with perseverance and patience for the celebration of your place in our lives and your presence in our world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn that we'd invite you to join in if you know it is Joy comes with the dawn.
invite you now to join me in our prayer of confession for this morning. Let us pray. Patient God, forgive our impatience. Help us wait faithfully as we prepare to hear and receive not only your word, but your very presence in our lives and in our world. Fill our lamps with your grace that we might be ready to receive your forgiveness and celebrate your unity with us. We pray now that you hear the silent confessions of our hearts. And hear the assurance of forgiveness. Awake and alert, we are given new life in Christ, strengthened by God's grace, forgiven and reconciled by God's love to prepare anew for God's coming reign in our world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our Psalter reading for this morning is Psalm 78, verses 1 through 4, and verses 9 through 16. Hear these words. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter, utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our forebearers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generations the glorious deeds of the Lord, the might and wonders God has wrought. The Ephraimites, armed with the bow, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to God's law. They forgot the deeds of the Lord, the miracles that God had shown them. The Lord wrought miracles in the sight of their forebears in the land of Egypt and the fields of Zoan. The Lord divided the sea and let them pass through it and made the waters stand like a heap, led them with a cloud in the daytime and at a night with a fiery light, cleft rocks in the wilderness. They gave them drink abundantly as from the deep, made streams come out of the rock and waters flow down like rivers. going to ask now that you join in singing our hymn of praise, which is Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, page 89 in the hymnal. Thank you. 
Our scripture reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Hear these words. The kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. We had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went out to buy it, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the word of God for the people of God. We give thanks to God for the reading and hearing of his holy word. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, I pray the words of my mouth and the thoughts on all of our hearts might be acceptable to you. O God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Uh, One of the things that I hope you have learned about me thus far as our journey together as pastor and, and congregation is that I can be fairly upfront and honest with you about our scripture readings on Sunday mornings. Some of them are wonderful, They give us strength for the journey. They're very uplifting. Others have a certain amount of humor embedded in them. And then there are scriptures like the one that we just read for this morning. Scriptures that I just plain don't like. And to be honest with you, I've never liked this particular parable. It seems like Jesus always has a story about a wedding that didn't go as planned. Sort of makes you wonder if he ever recovered from that little incident with his mom at the wedding in Cana. Either way, In this particular case, the bridesmaids seem to mess up, or half of them do. Now, I'll admit that I've been at a fair number of weddings, uh, and this doesn't seem like it should be a really big, huge deal. They're with the bride, waiting for the bridegroom to come and to marry the bride. But there were some bridesmaids that didn't bring oil with them. And when the bridegroom arrived later than expected, it throws everything off schedule and they act on behalf, on uh, the advice of the other bridesmaids who tell them to go and buy more oil of their own, which they go and do. But when they return, the party's in full swing, the doors are locked, and the bridegroom who doesn't know them won't let them in. And the reason that I don't like this parable is that at first glance, it seems like the fault lands squarely on the bridegroom's shoulders. And I think that it's his fault for two reasons. Number one, he's late. When you let people know a a certain time, uh, you need to show up at that time. He didn't seem to let anyone know that he's going to be late. So when you give the bridesmaids a time and you don't show up, you're the one at fault. Reason number two, when the uh, bridesmaids return later, he won't let them in. So he sets up this situation and then he won't take any responsibility for it. I don't know about you, but that seems kind of rude to me. And I'm not done throwing blame around just yet. I also blame the other bridesmaids as well, because it seems like they're being selfish with their oil. And they also seem to set up the bridesmaids who didn't bring any extra oil with them by suggesting they go out into the night and buy more of their own, which isn't good advice at all. I mean, it's dangerous out there, especially for women at night in that time culture. And anyway, no oil dealer in their right mind is going to be open that late anyway. Part of what we try to teach and what we try to live out as Christians is to share what we have with those that don't have. But apparently, for some reason, that doesn't seem to apply here. So it just seems like they're being selfish. Yet this parable doesn't seem to blame either the insensitivity or the bridegroom or the selfishness of the wise bridesmaids. This parable leads us to the conclusion The so-called foolish bridesmaids are the ones who are to bear the blame for the outcome. And that's why I don't like this parable, because that bothers me. 
after all, I think that at some point we've all found ourselves on of poor planning, where we've been guilty of poor planning, finding ourselves on the wrong side of a locked door. If we're fortunate, we'll find someone that has a sense of compassion or someone that has a sense of mercy or even a sense of humor that'll help get us back to where we need to be. But there doesn't seem to be any grace, there doesn't seem to be any compassion or any humor to be found here. The foolish bridesmaids are locked out of the party and that's the end of the story. But in thinking about this, I was reminded of a wedding that one of my colleagues did. Uh, and at this wedding, by the way, if you want wedding stories, ask us pastors. We certainly have them. Anyway, at this particular wedding, there was a large party that preceded uh, the wedding the night before. And as a result of that, the uh, best man, whose job it is to hold the rings for the bride and the groom, wasn't feeling too well as a result of that party. Now, the first part of the wedding went by without any complications at all. My friend had just finished his meditation, and then there was supposed to be a piece of music that was played on the organ. And that piece went a little longer than expected, because right when it started, the best man, according to my friend, got very pale. And he whispered as quietly as he could to my friend and the groom that he was going to be sick and hurried off to the men's room. The organist was able to see all of this from her vantage point in the sanctuary, so she just kept playing and playing and playing, and everyone else just kept waiting and waiting and waiting until an usher realized something needed to be done and went to retrieve the best man, who returned looking like he had just gotten out of bed and was still very pale. Now, after the wedding, he incurred the wrath of the entire wedding party, especially the mother of the bride. Serves him right, in my opinion. I mean, he had one simple job to do, and at the critical moment, he'd left his post. That story I remembered this week, and it has somewhat influenced my understanding of this parable. The foolish bridesmaids didn't do anything wrong by not bringing any extra oil with them, nor was it their fault that they had fallen asleep. If you read the scripture, all of them had fallen asleep. This is what had happened. Their one task was to welcome the bridegroom with joy. But when that critical moment arrived, they had left their post. They were foolish. They acted as if their job was to have oil in their lamps and to find more if they lacked it. But that wasn't their primary job. That wasn't their primary task. The oil was only a means to an end, and it's not even clear if it was a necessary means. Their task, their job, was to communicate joy between bride and bridegroom. And their job was to tell the good news, but by confusing ends with means, they failed in that task. Now, on the other hand, we could see this uh, parable as a criticism of the religious leaders of Jesus' day, the scribes, the Pharisees, the priests in Jerusalem, their main job, their main task, was not to keep the temple beautiful and making a profit. Their primary job, their primary task was to keep the people connected to God and to greet the promised arrival of God with joy. But when Jesus arrived, they viewed him as more of a nuisance than anything else. He was interfering with the temple's profitability. And as a result of that, they viewed him as a threat because they too had confused ends with means. And in an effort to keep their lamps burning, they left their post. They didn't welcome Jesus with joy. It was just the opposite, actually. Now, it's all well and good that this parable tells us about the Pharisees and the scribes of Jesus' day, but this parable also has implications for us as well. Because we should note that our primary job, that our primary task, is not to preserve our religion. Our primary job and primary task is to communicate the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. It is to communicate joy, the joy of knowing Jesus, the joy of Jesus' victory over sin and death, the joy of Christ's presence with us, the joy of Christ's promised return. The question I think we need to ask ourselves is this, do our lives, our individual lives, our lives as congregations and 
our lives as two different denominations, do they radiate joy? There are reasons that we need to ask ourselves that question, brothers and sisters, and there are serious reasons. Because if it's true that there are so many Christians in our nation and so many people describe themselves as spiritual, why are the mainline churches shrinking? Now, I don't have any scientific evidence to back this up, but I think part of the reason comes down to joy. I don't think it's so much that people reject the truth of Jesus. I think it's rather they reject our joylessness. They don't see us taking pleasure in our faith or in our communities of faith. And people are desperately searching for joy in this time in our world. And they don't see that we have any to offer them. And what does this joylessness look like? Well, in my opinion, we as Christians spend far too much time criticizing each other and highlighting each other's faults. We may need to go back to the old saying, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. It happens all the time between conservatives and liberals, evangelicals and mainliners, Catholics and Orthodox. We spend so much time recording each other's faults, and then we convince ourselves that we're being faithful disciples by doing so. But that's not true. And I know I've done this myself. I still do it from time to time. It's sometimes is difficult not to do. Now, our, our joylessness can also look like an exercise of power at times. Jesus taught us to view leadership as an opportunity to practice servanthood. But that doesn't happen all the time. When it comes to determining the direction of the church, we can at times be like the soldiers of soldiers beneath the cross of Jesus, fighting over his clothing. And in doing so, we communicate to the secular world that we'd rather rule apart from God than with God forever in heaven. And honestly, what's ever won is one of the church war is absurdly small in the big picture anyway. But enough with that. Our, most importantly, our joylessness can also look like ineffectiveness. Brothers and sisters, the world right now is dying for good news. And we have that, both in word and in deed. But when we use up all of our energies with criticism, with manipulation of power, with empty conversations about small and minor details, when we do that and it's all said and done with, we may not have any joy left to offer. And in conversations with some of my colleagues, this is something that we've started to notice. Pastors have started to notice with their lay leadership. One of the things that we found is that when people first come on boards and committees, especially if they're young and this is their first time serving on a board or a committee, they do so with a lot of enthusiasm. They're looking for spiritual growth and meaningful engagement with and for the world. But oftentimes when their term is up, they're burned out, disinterested, and joyless. But meaningful, effective service gives joy. <clears throat> joy gives energy for more profoundly effective service. But when that connection between joy and work is broken, the result of ineffectiveness and joylessness is the result. Like the foolish bridesmaids, we sometimes lose track of our role Become, we become fixated on secondary matters, and that can happen as individuals, as congregations, and as denominations. And as a consequence, we leave our posts. Like the wise bridesmaids, we need to be concerned about less with oil and more with joy, and communicating that joy so that those inside and those outside the house can experience joy as well. And as a denomination, as congregation as individuals, where do we find this joy? Well, if we look at the Westminster Shorter Catechism, it says that the chief goal in life is to glorify and enjoy God forever. To put that another way, we don't go searching for joy. Joy is given to us. The good news in this parable is the bride, that the bridesmaids never had to go looking for the bridegroom. Bridegroom has already come. The joy that God gives to me and you, it's already here. 
It's a present reality. We just need to stay where we're told, to open our arms to the joy that is ours and realize that a life of giving joy and receiving joy, that's what it's all about. It's not about possessions. It's not about power. It's not about wealth or positions for us in the church. It's about the joy of Christ. And for that, I say thanks be to God. Amen. As a response to the word this morning, I'd ask that you join me in the prayer that our Lord and Savior taught us. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, for our closing song today, there are some of you that are going to love me for this and some of you that are going to really dislike me for this. But we're singing a song that uh, might be a tad early, but it goes really well with what we just read. And it's joy to the world. But listen to this. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Like I said, our joy here is a present reality. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns, and the Savior continues to reign. Let earth, all their, let all their songs employ, both fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. So let's join now in singing, Joy to the World, 246.
Ask now that you receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Go forth today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, and uh, hopefully we will see you again in person next week. God's blessings to you.